got a lot on my mind and when I start my rides, I don't actually have any plan of what I'm going to talk about and then eventually something comes out. The other day I started one and I, I alluded to having a need to talk about the legacy of Wollongong, the World Championships there in September this year. And then I giggled and thought, no, I best not do that because there's reason that I'd like to talk about it, but it's also quite complicated and it needs a lot of context. So I thought I'd give it a little crack just before my ride today and see if the right words come out so that I can explain my thinking behind the need for an article, which I'm still preparing, about the legacy of the World Championships of 2022 in Wollongong. I've worked at the Olympics in the press service. I've worked at World Championships in past. We organised the expo for the successful 2010 World Championships. It was a huge show. There were many, many exhibitors. And I think the Geelong Worlds was an enormous success. There is a legacy from 2010 when you, the UCI first came to Australia to host Road Cycling World Championships, and that is, well, let's be clear, there's an event called the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race, and it's well supported by the Victorian government. When it was announced that Wollongong would host the World Championships in 2022, it caught me by surprise. At the time, Stephen Drake was the uh, CEO of what was then called Cycling Australia. And he explained the process. He went to Austria, to Innsbruck, along with um, Duncan Murray, the chairman of what was then called Cycling Australia, and as well as Kip Kaufman. And um, the three of them put together a bid that not many people knew about, but it was based on the knowledge that New South Wales had been keen to procure 10 world-class events within a certain time frame. I can't remember what that was. And it turns out that the New South Wales government was prepared to contribute significant funding for this. I know the figure, but I'm reluctant to share it right now. Let's say it was significant. And that was the very first investment and that was basically what it cost Australia or New South Wales to convince the UCI that the World Championships could be hosted or staged in Australia for the second time. Queensland also put in a bid for the 2022 World Championships and that didn't come because more or less New South Wales offered more money. That's my understanding. South Australia contemplated the idea of putting in a bid and then thought, no, it's okay, we've got our cycling event and it's called the Tour Down Under and we've been backing that since we built it from inception in 1999. There's been a pause and we know the reasons why and it's coming back and I can't wait to be back in Adelaide in January doing what we do with fellow cyclists, enjoying ourselves, looking around, riding our bikes and catching the vibe of a terrific event which has been a success on every level. The aim of the Tour Down Under was to have a legacy, was to entice people to come and visit South Australia, was to encourage cycling and it's done those things. Good job. Fantastic. And that is, by the way, bipartisan support. It's happened throughout levels of government, throughout changes of government, I should say. And um, it continues to be backed by a government, a state government, that then puts in sufficient funding to not just stage the event, but to ensure that the event is a success. What happened in Wollongong was that the bid was won, a CEO was appointed, and from there it pretty much went downhill. There's a lot more to it, but I can say this. My question about the legacy of Wollongong 2022 relates to the very fact that on the first day of Stu Taggart's tenure as CEO, I spoke with him and we talked about what the net effect of this investment needed to be. And he told me that he would be focusing on ensuring that the event had a legacy. Terrific, I thought. That's exactly what it needs to be. It's all well and good to have a week of fantastic racing and a big carnival atmosphere and world attention and 
international guests and famous bike riders and all the trimmings that come along with what ended up happening in Wollongong. I um, was reluctant to go down there because I knew it would be expensive to stay, but in the end I made a commitment and I made an investment and I went and stayed at the Sage Hotels in Wollongong and I had a great room in a terrific spot, very close to the circuit, and I really enjoyed myself. I stuffed things up a little bit, I would say, because it was my first race since the pandemic, my first international race since the pandemic, and I'd basically lost my rhythm on how to report. That's my fault, and I take responsibility for it. I've expressed my um, frustration with uh, the antics of Oz Cycling, and I maintain that they didn't manage things correctly when it came to the media and generating exposure for an event that I was looking forward to and many others were too. But that's another topic. Oz Cycling, for the record, was the address that I needed to bill when I wrote some articles that were commissioned for the official guide. There was an official guide for the World Championships. The chances of you seeing that are incredibly slim. I know a rough estimate of what the print run ended up being, and it was a token gesture. It was done to fulfil requirements that the UCI had imposed on the organising committee of Wollongong, but it was not at all treated as a commercial exercise. It was a huge waste of money. And even the official guide for the World Championships of 2022 didn't come out until the Thursday of the championships. And it was never to be seen in a news agent. There were boxes shipped. The UCI saw it. David Lepartian probably looked at it and said, great, I'll read that later. And I think that that sort of begins to sort of give a bit of context to why I'm so frustrated about the book, the so-called legacy of Wollongong 2022. It was underdone. It was overmanaged on many levels and undermanaged on the key elements of what makes a bike race successful. The community was warned that there would be significant road closures and it would impact their way of life. Schools were closed down and all sorts of measures were put in place so that the UCI could get the road closures that they deemed necessary. And that is all well and good. If you speak to people from Wollongong, they'll tell you, or at least the ones that I've spoken to, that they were surprised how easy it was to actually get around. But they had been given a fear factor that prompted many to leave town, to take a pause from their work, from their school, and to basically go so that cycling could take over. Wollongong didn't have sufficient hotels to host the people who wanted to come to the championships and therefore people who left town put their houses on Airbnb and the like so that other people could come and stay and therefore watch the pro and watch elite cycling, world-class cycling like they wanted to do. But they had to be prepared to pay a huge amount of money Accommodation prices were overinflated. I know. They were price gouging, that's a fact. <sighs> During my time in Wollongong for the championships, I went out every evening in search of this carnival atmosphere that I was promised. I walked around the lighthouse, which was beautiful. It was lit up in a spectacular light show and it was done so that the UCI could see it from their headquarters at the Novotel nearby, and everything looked fantastic. The big thing that was lacking was any sense of a vibe. I was told there would be carnivals and parties and concerts and this and that. I went in search of them, but they certainly weren't near the finish site. There was an expo and plenty of industry people got along and supported that. Bravo to the likes of Full Gaz and Bike Sports and Santini and Orbear and Trek and others who contributed to making it seem like a cycling event. 
but a lot more could have been done. In the end, we saw a couple of fantastic races. I think the final weekend basically allowed Stu Taggart to put his work for the UCI World Championships of 2022 on his resume with pride because Saturday and Sunday were unbelievably good. Saturday was all kinds of weather and a freak of a victory by Annemiek van Flirten, which still blows my mind. And then Sunday came and Remco weaved his magic. We got an Australian on the podium. The weather was brilliant, the sun shone and the wind eased and the party came to town and it was magic. A few hours after the race, that vibe was poof and gone. A few months after the racing, I realised that I haven't been back to Wollongong since. I was riding there round about once a fortnight. Sometimes driving with my bike, sometimes riding all the way generally soaking up the atmosphere and I was creating some videos to say to people, come to Wollongong, ride your bike, it's bloody unreal. Since the Worlds, I haven't done that. There's been other reasons. I've had some incidents, some injuries, some things that have happened and I'm starting to roam on the bike again. But the lure of Wollongong isn't as strong as it was before when I thought I was previewing something that would really stop the nation. From the get-go, I realised that the Wollongong World Championships faced a big problem, and that is that it coincided with the grand final weekend for the AFL. My team, the Sydney Swans, played on the Saturday and I tried to watch while also paying attention to the women's road race. But I knew from my experience in Wollongong, I mean in Geelong, in, in 2010, when the AFL grand final had been scheduled for the week prior to the World Championships of Cycling, but then there was a drawn grand final and it was replayed on the Saturday of the women's road race. And I saw the impact that that had on the cycling event. Cameras that had been in place in Geelong for the time trials and the build up to the women's road race were taken back to Melbourne to the MCG so that they could be used for the replay of the grand final. This year, everything was done in haste. Bike riders had to get on a plane the day that they won the Vuelta. Both the champions of the road races on the final weekend were also both the winners of the Vuelta in Spain, Annemiek van Flirten and Remco Evenepoel. Both of them were on the plane the night of their win in Spain or the day after. Annemiek the night, Monday for Remco. And they came to Australia, had little time to overcome jet lag, but they managed it eventually. They probably didn't have the time trials that they would have liked to have had. Annemiek certainly didn't. And that's what made her road race win even more remarkable. But my thinking is why didn't they delay it at least another week? If the UCI wanted this blue ribbon event on the other side of the world in 2022, why didn't they facilitate a, cam a, a calendar that suited that? The first week of October would have been much better than the last week of September. That's based on my knowledge of the Australian sporting calendar. Stephen Drake and Duncan Murray may have suggested that, but it didn't pan out because the USAI got what they wanted. They had a race in Australia, and then there were events that were still part of the world tour to be contested in Europe shortly after. The riders came, they stayed briefly, they left. That's a great shame. That's a little bit of an intro and a little summary of some of the things that come to mind when I think about the World Championships of Wollongong in 2022. I say it in the dark before I go for a bike ride on a Wednesday morning and I might talk about it some more. But I'd also like to say this, if you have some observations that you'd like to share with me about your Wollongong experiences, please chime in, leave a comment, let me know. Please tell me if you plan to go but just couldn't afford to, couldn't get a place to stay. Let me know if you went like I did and had a terrific time and saw some great racing 
and then got the buzz. Let me know this though, if you went and because of what you saw, you became a member of Oz Cycling, I want to know that. Please leave a comment if that's you. By my estimation, the legacy of this investment for an event which was lobbied for by the powers to be that became an entity called Oz Cycling. The quest for a promotion of a sport which we all know and love came and it went and there is no legacy. I don't think that there was a spike in membership. I know that the ratings for the World Championships were disappointing to say the very least in Australia. Having pay TV being the host broadcaster is one element of the errors that were made in advance of the racing. And there were many others. <sighs> to the small team that did end up putting on a championships that will, that is remembered, even if it has little legacy, well done. I'm not criticizing your efforts. But for the people who shunned the offers of support and the opportunity to promote cycling the way it could have been, I think it's a great shame that you didn't invest that little bit more. We know from what the investment in Geelong provided, a World Tour event that now is returning in 2023 thanks to the Victorian Government, and from what South Australia created in 1999, a stage race, which is really quite captivating for the very fact that it turns a city into a cycling festival, that events in Australia that relate to cycling can succeed and prosper and have an ongoing legacy. But the investment that was made in Wollongong wasn't enough. Even though it was expensive, they did the bare minimum and if they made the commitment to entice the UCI to hold the championships here, what needed to be done was to ensure that all other elements of the package were also considered and funded. That didn't happen. Wollongong, thanks for doing what you did. It was a great, initiative. It was a great concept, but it could have been much, much, much better.